Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be COVID-19, a view from above, a view from the ground. I'd like to welcome Avital Balwit to the virtual stage to begin our session. Welcome everyone to this panel. My name is Avital Balwit and I work with Radical Exchange and I help plan this conference. So I really hope you're enjoying it. This is perfect placement after Glenn's talk on COVID-19. So for all of you who just watched that, I don't think this discussion will be redundant. We're gonna be filling in some of the details that Glenn didn't get to discuss in his more big picture talk. So thank you all for sticking around. We're incredibly lucky to have these panelists, two of who have been flying all around the country um, to help test and treat sick Americans and the other two who have been busy working on publishing COVID related research. So we're really lucky to have any of their time. A couple practical things to note, this session will be 50 minutes long and I'm hoping to devote at least the last 15 minutes to audience questions. So if you're watching this on Brilla, you can submit your questions right next to the screen. And you can also upvote the questions of others to make sure that we answer the most popular questions. First, I will briefly introduce um, the first speaker. Agatha Basilar leads field operations at Curative, one of the largest COVID-19 testing companies in the United States. Prior to joining Curative, she ran for US Congress in San Francisco and spent five years at Emerson Collective. There she partnered with leading nonprofits, activists, artists, and policymakers to advance education, um, immigration, criminal justice, and environmental reform. Agatha is a dual Brazilian American citizen. She studied product design engineering at Stanford, and she's a founding member of the nonprofit Democracy Earth, who I've worked with in the past and is where I met Agatha. Our next panelist is Divya Siddharth, who works on building, testing, and studying impactful technology. Her work covers a broad range of applications in the intersection of technology and society, including digital work political communication, digital security and privacy, and tech augmented cooperation and collectivization. She is currently a fellow at Microsoft Research India and has done extensive field work in urban and rural contexts, studying and implementing large scale technology interventions, interventions for societal good. Her work has been published in the ACM Conference on Computing and Sustainable Societies and the ACM Conference on Information and Communication Technologies for Development. She has previously taught classes at Stanford University in both the computer science and political science departments in collaboration with the Digital Civil Society Lab. Our next speaker is Anton Kornak, who is an Associate Professor of Economics at UVA's Department of Economics and Darden School of Business and focuses his current research and teaching on the implications of artificial intelligence for business, for the economy and for the future of work. And I've been lucky enough to take classes with him there. After earning his PhD in economics for from Columbia University in 2007. He worked on designing policy measures to prevent financial crises and developed an influential framework for capital flow regulation in emerging economies. His research has been published in top journals, including the American Economic Review, the Review of Economic Studies, the Journal of Econometrics, the Journal of Monetary Economics, the Journal of International Economics, and the Journal of Public Economics. It has also been cited on Bloomberg, in The Economist, and in The Wall Street Journal. He has won several fellowships and awards for his work, including from the Institute for New Economic Thinking. He is also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. And last but not least, our final panelist is Ann Young Lee, who has served as the Chief Executive Officer of CORE, Community Organized Relief Effort, Sean Penn's disaster relief charity since 2016. During that time, she has overseen the successful transition from a Haiti-based recovery organization to an international response and resilience building NGO responding to crises in Puerto Rico, across the Caribbean, in Latin America, and the continental United States. CORE currently works on a range of programs, including reforestation, sustainable agriculture, education and youth development, community health, women's entrepreneurship, extensive rebuilding and reconstruction efforts, and disaster preparedness. Lee is the author of Livelihoods in Emergencies, A Double-Edged Sword. She developed a gender-sensitive emergency assessment tool called the CLARA, while with the Women's Refugee Commission, which is now being used by international organizations around the world. She also received the Society for International Development's prestigious Truman Award in May 2009. So we're very lucky to have these four panelists. And I'm gonna kick it off with an easy question, which is I'd like you all to spend a few minutes talking about how your work is connected to or has been impacted by COVID-19. And since you're next to me on the screen, Agatha, I'm gonna have you kick it off and we can go Agatha, Anton, Anne, and Divya. 
Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. I'm so interested to hear from everyone's background. So I'm Agatha, I work at Curative, which I think to date has, we have built the largest COVID-19 testing laboratory in the Western hemisphere that's based in Washington DC. And we can do 50,000 tests per day in each of our labs. We have one in California. And I started very early when the company just started in March and we've helped to scale it up to where it is today. And I do field operations there. So anytime our test kits are out in the field and in the hands of real patients, I help roll those test sites out. And oftentimes in collaboration with Ann Lee. All right, Anton, let's move it over to you. Great. So first, let me say thank you for putting together this really interesting panel. Um, yeah, uh, I'm an economist by training. And uh, when uh, COVID-19 started uh, to basically uh, go live to uh, spread around the world, uh, I thought, hmm, uh, this is really one of those uh, things uh, that forces you to uh, rethink what you want to uh, work on. And uh, in economics, we deal a lot uh, with uh, models that uh, essentially share a lot of uh, characteristics uh, to epidemiology. And uh, so I thought, hmm, let me think a little bit about the connection between economics and epidemiology. Uh, and uh, I started to write a, a paper uh, that analyzes essentially the trade-offs between uh, what people uh, called uh, saving lives versus saving livelihoods. Now, I quickly realized that there actually isn't a trade-off. Uh, it really turns out that as long as we don't have uh, the uh, ongoing pandemic under control, our economies around the world will not be able to recover. Uh, but that's at least how I started out. And um, yeah, I look forward to discussing what exactly uh, that implies for how we can deal uh, with the ongoing pandemic uh, during the rest of the panel. Thank you so much. And Divya, what about yourself? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I've been working on studying technology and democracy in different spaces, mostly in India. Um, and you know, have looked at social media and social movements, tech policy in various kinds of ways, collectivization. Uh, and, and something I love about this panel and, and that inspires me about you know, the response to COVID is how people of so many different backgrounds have come forward and said, you know, something, something that is really disastrous is happening and we want to use our different kinds of skill sets to help. And you know, not just in, in research and, and implementation, but mutual aid groups and, and all of these ways that we're coming forward to support each other. So you know, I, I think that's really incredible and has been inspiring. Um, the flip side, which is sort of what Glenn was mentioning is that it's it's been difficult to coordinate a response. So my beginnings with the, the COVID work has been working with Glenn and Danielle, um, who as you mentioned, have been co-chairing this rapid response initiative out of Harvard Safra Center in terms of how we can build pandemic resilience. And I think while people have really stepped forward to build that kind of resilience, a lot of our institutions, as we talked about earlier, may not have and and we're seeing this um in the outcomes right and, and our initiative was around sort of we don't just need to mitigate this this disease mitigate the harms but we can really suppress it we can really you know make make sure that there isn't this trade-off between lives and livelihoods that that we've talked about that doesn't exist and that's what the initiative was around and i think uh, there have been some successes. There's also, we're seeing the major disparities in terms of like racial and socioeconomic disparities with regards to COVID. And so I've sort of been working on mitigating those, but also how do we make our response something that not just, again, not just mitigates those disparities in the short term, but, you know, thinks about dismantling those systems in the long term. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And again, really excited to, to be on this panel with everyone. Awesome, thank you so much. And Anne, it seems like CORE has transitioned immensely to focusing on COVID, so I'd love to hear about your efforts. Sure, um, I think it's been um, an interesting progression. You know, we've been always really uh, focused on supporting communities respond to disasters. So this is, in a sense, very typical in terms of the type of response that we do. 
And I think that as an organization, because we do target sort of, you know, the most vulnerable communities for us, you know, having it happen within our own backyards has really just emphasized again, you know, the, the things that, that become so obvious in these disasters, that there are certain communities because of inequalities, because of racial injustice, economic exclusion, that always get hit the hardest. So in a sense, it's very similar to the, thing, the things that we've been doing. Um, and in a sense, it's completely different because it's affecting our own families, it's in our own neighborhoods, and it's just at such a huge scale. Um, but we knew that we needed to engage. And because of, I think, you know, a bit of our, our sort of ethos of, you know, just digging in and jumping in and, and as a small organization that's very flexible um, and kind of more risk absorbent, um, we've been able to kind of jump into the mix and with amazing partners like Agatha and Curative and like the fire department from Los Angeles who have really shown us the ropes. I mean, we're an organization that, I mean, none of us really knew about COVID, but you know, learning the, the different component pieces and how they all sort of come together, how they affect things differently is something that, you know, we've really taken on as an organization. Um, but again, at the fundamental piece of it is the ethos towards targeted communities and having a very holistic approach to how we can address, um, you know, controlling the spread, but also supporting the communities that are impacted the hardest. Um, what we've seen over and over again in so many disasters that, you know, people are making constantly very rational decisions. Um, you cannot separate, as you were saying, Anton, livelihoods from life, right? Because a lot of times, especially in very, very vulnerable neighborhoods and, 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 and countries, they're one and they're too intertwined. So for example, after the earthquake, you see that even though people knew that building a home um, without sort of proper code or, or quality materials that they're putting themselves again in danger for another earthquake. And yet they're making that decision because they're, they're, it's a conscious, rational decision of immediate safety and security, being able to have access to livelihoods to survive to the next day versus something long-term that just might happen you know, at some point. So I think, you know, our role is really to kind of support these communities to make the best decisions and to protect them as best as we can by, by stemming the spread while also addressing the underlying disaster that has been happening for so many decades, which is poverty, inequality, and all the things that we were, I think we're all here for. But wanna say thank you so much for inviting me to this panel and Agatha for, for throwing me in the mix. Um, and yeah, excited to, to discuss further, dig in. Thank you so much. Yes, those are exactly the values that sort of this conference and this movement focus on, focuses on, which is looking for flexible local solutions, targeting inequality, targeting things at the roots. Um, and I also want to mention, I'm moving on to our next question, but if any of you guys want to respond to something that's been said, you can always tack it on before you answer or just unmute yourself and start talking. I want this to be sort of a natural conversation. Um, my next question is directed more towards Agatha and Anne. And both of you, I'd love to hear from both of you um, about what are the different types of testing? I feel like there's a lot of confusion about that. And I'd love to hear just more about your experience with ramping up testing um, in different places across the country and sort of how close we are to this um, dream of universal testing. Mm -hmm. Go for it, Agatha. <laughs> All right, so briefly to cover the different types of testing that exist, I'd say there's three main kinds. There's what used to be considered the gold standard, which is nasal pharyngeal or NP test. Those are sometimes called the brain swab that go, you require a healthcare provider to do it to you and it goes deep in your nose, like a brain swab. Um, it's a bit cringeworthy, uncomfortable, requires a lot of PPE or personal protective equipment to do. Um, and then there's another test, both that are self-collected. One is a nasal mid-turbinate test where you get like a cute short Q-tip and you do it up your nose to yourself. And then the last kind, which is the kind that I our lab makes is a self-collected oral fluid sample or a mouth swab test where we ask patients to cough three to five times like this into their elbow. And that brings up the fluids from your lungs into your mouth. And then you use a swab to swab for about 20 seconds put it in a little test tube in a baggie and put it in the collection bag until it gets to the lab. And that's done through PCR testing. 
we can go if we want to get into the science of it happy to explain the life cycle of a of a swab and the four different rooms that it goes to in a lab but in terms of scaling i i resonated with what anton said that when COVID hit everyone had to reevaluate how we wanted to get involved and I, I got involved with COVID on March 18th. And I know this because um, I had just spent the last year running for Congress. I was hoping to get earn the second most votes that didn't happen. And our campaign ended on Super Tuesday of this year in March. And I was just staying home, kind of unwinding from it all, figuring out what I was gonna do. And I just saw this tweet about a COVID lab scaling up and we ended up getting on a phone call I didn't know any of the people there, but they were like, can you get to this lab by 8 a.m. tomorrow? And so I just hopped in my car in San Francisco with my partner. We drove through the night, slept in our parking lot and came to a warehouse that was completely empty. There were no PCR machines. If you brought us a sample, we wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, and it was, a, it was a, a young Silicon Valley crew of people who were doing something completely unrelated or they were doing diagnostic testing, but just realized that the United States wasn't gonna have enough testing available and decided to drop everything and pivot 100% towards COVID testing. So it's been really interesting seeing that rat bump. Um, happy to jump in, but wanna let others speak and, and you should I had ahead. no idea that's how you guys started. <laughs> oh, yes. For your background, Agatha, we've been working <laughs> together for so long, it's crazy. <laughs> and just as a caveat, like, you know, for us, as an organization, we've been working with all the different types of, of tests that are out there. And we have no formal relationship with Curative. We get no sort of like, you know, it's just through happenstance that we were connected because Los Angeles um, City had been using Curative. But I have to say, you know, again, not specifically endorsing Curative, but appreciate what you guys have done. Like what we find is that you know, with the different types of tests that we have available, and we work in several different cities across the US, it's hard as it is right now in a lot of the communities that we work in where there's already a lot of mistrust and it's hard to get people out to get tested, to have them come out and do the deep NP swabs. Um, the oral kits that Curative has been able to do is able to reach a huge amount of folk um, a lot easier. So, you know, I mean, sometimes I feel like, oh my God, we sound like salespeople for curative, but we're always like, you have to get curative because it's the oral swab. Everyone likes it. It's not invasive. You're doing it on your own. But I think the big piece is, is all right, the, you know, fundamentally the issue is it is very difficult to get people that we target to come out and get tested. It takes a lot of um, community development, community engagement, trust building which as a community-based organization, we understand and we get it and, and it's important, but also you know, to, to any barriers, any challenges, um, we wanna kind of like lower those barriers as much as possible. And you know, having the oral kit has been very, very useful to be able to do that. And it allows us also to kind of um, get a higher throughput than what we would normally get with an NP um, an NP. The midterm in it is similar because it is a self swab, so it's less, it, it does take as, um, it's, it, it's as quick. Um, but I have to say again, it's the, the community building at the end of the day that um, really determines for us the usefulness of having the oral self swab. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been running quite a few cl clinical trials to get the FDA authorization, and people are more willing to get their blood drawn every week for 50 weeks than to get one NP test. They're just so afraid or traumatized by that experience. I mean, my mother is here visiting me for the first time in many months. And I told her you would have to get tested before you, we, we spent time together. And she was like, is it gonna be one of those nose nasal NP tests? Because if it is, it's not worth it for me to come visit you. She, <laughs> when I told her it was the oral test then. And she made her way over. Thank you both so much. It's, it's so interesting and, and really inspirational, honestly, to hear about that rapid turnaround and just to know about the immense hard work that's going into making sure that there's enough tests to go around. The next question I, I have, it's sort of, I don't want to enforce the sort of false 
public health or economic health narrative, but we are going to turn over to the economy right now. Um, so this question is more directed at Anton and Divya, but of course the other two are completely welcome to jump in whenever you want. Um, so just sort of what are your thoughts on how um, your predictions about economic effects, like how should that shape our COVID response? What do you think that that tells us to do, if anything? So uh, I'm, I'm happy to start on that. Um, well, uh, my, my uh, hope and prediction uh, a couple of months ago was that we will uh, basically uh, try to do whatever it takes to get this virus under control and uh, to make sure that it doesn't spread as widely as it does and as soon as that has happened that uh, our economy will be able to recover again. Now over the past uh, month or so I guess we've all realized that uh, in the US uh, there will not be the political will uh, to actually make this happen. Uh, and that means we all need to be prepared uh, for uh, the epidemic to continue to rage for yeah, many, many months, most likely. Uh, my expectation is uh, it will continue to rage essentially until uh, we have a vaccine. Uh, which I do still hope we will be able to have. Um, now, uh, what shall we uh, do economy-wise? So, so um, given, given that it will probably continue to rage for uh, quite some time now, um, and uh, that we don't have the will uh, to really contain the disease like other countries have done it, uh, the, the US uh, is in, in some ways uh, one of the very few uh, advanced countries that uh, have not tried uh, what it takes to get this under control. Uh, so we will have to uh, live with the virus uh, and uh, try to make uh, that experience uh, as, uh, how should I say, uh, life worthy as possible. So. Um, I'm, I was very much inspired by Agatha's story before, and I'm so glad that uh, we do have uh, a lot of efforts uh, to continue to keep things somewhat at bay, uh, even though I can't see uh, COVID uh, being uh, really suppressed like it was in other countries. Um, and I think we will have to get used to the idea that, uh, well, um, for the next six, maybe nine, maybe 12 months, uh, there will always be this constant background risk. Uh, we will uh, have to get used to the fact that there's gonna be some activities that uh, our economy used uh, to engage in and that we won't be able to do the way we used to. So let's say, for example, uh, you know, I'm uh, teaching at a university uh, we are uh, just going through the whole process now of figuring out how do we best teach with social distancing. Uh, uh, there's plans like to rotate one third of the students uh, every week and things like that. Um, and yeah, things will not go back to normal and our economy will not go back to normal. And honestly, I think uh, the US will really be lagging uh, most other advanced countries uh, with that experience. Yeah, I think jumping off of that, I mean, Anton, I think you covered a lot of sort of what we can expect in the future. I think something that, that interests me and that, that kind of gives me hope in a way is, is the manner in which we're trying to reevaluate how we think about the economy because of what's happening, right? I think um, Anne spoke to a lot of the structural inequities we're seeing. I think we we can't really talk about the economy, in, especially in times of crisis, without sort of thinking about economic justice and what that means. And I think, you know, we're seeing that nine and 10 are something Americans agree that this is an opportunity for, you know, large companies to focus on doing right by stakeholders. Only 25% in a recent Just Capital poll said that the current form of capitalism, you know, allows for this reset, allows for ensuring the greater good of society. There is a lot of disapproval of the government response, and and a lot of that is for really good reasons. And um, you know, we're seeing how the most effective international response, where 
you know, around maintaining income for workers in some way, like wage subsidies or short-term work programs or things like that, whereas the U.S. didn't quite do this. And, and while they did choose to operate through traditional unemployment and the one-time stimulus check, um, they didn't subsidize wages and they mostly didn't develop new programs, which means that not, not only has this majorly hurt people, but the Fed expects unemployment to be around 9% at the end of the year, which isn't the case for other countries. Even, even some of the other countries that didn't have a response as quickly as they should have still managed to put in some of these programs of maintaining income later. Um, and so I think that has really, really laid bare the ways that our economy is broken in terms of fulfilling its one of its main, probably its main function, which is, you know, providing for people. And, you know, we're, we're seeing as always, as, as we've all, I think, touched on the crisis laying bare, these, these inequities, but also the, the deep historical structural roots of these inequities. And, and I think, you know, we're not gonna go back to normal for a long time. And hopefully when we do, it's in a way that transforms some of these institutions that takes you know, advantage in a sense of this absolute tragedy to make sure that we don't, you know, we address the reasons that it happened this way, not just some of the solutions that we could do in the short term, but some of those long-term things in terms of reimagining the economy, right? And, and I, I love that this conference has talked about that a lot. And I think if anything can come out of this, it's that the next normal will be a much better normal, um, you know, in health and in, in economy and justice and, and all of those pieces of, of the way we live. Thank you so much. That was um, a slightly pessimistic take, but I like the end, the note of hope at the end. And, and honestly, that's the, that's the world we're facing right now. Um, but definitely speaking to all of you, I think it does give me some more hope for how our transition out of this will look. Um, a big theme of this conference has been the role of technocracy and the role of experts um, in addressing crises in society. And a lot of people think that um, the pandemic response largely has to come from scientists or from experts in various fields. And well, of course, there's definitely a huge role for good science. I think that that sometimes underestimates the capacity of communities and individuals. So this next question is for Anne. Um, CORE's community-centered response to crises really inspires me, and particularly the way that you're training volunteers to do testing, and you're really empowering the communities that you're coming into. So I'd love to hear a bit more about that. So I just want to also go back to Divya's statement. Like, I know that it, it almost sounds a bit pessimist, uh, pessimistic, but I totally agree with you. Um, so in answering your question, I think one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in this, and especially as a or community-based organization who is doing a lot of testing, it's just been a shock to me, you know, in terms of the faith that I've had in our institutions and our health system, maybe, you know, was not realistic. And it's really laid bare the failures of these systems and of our health system in particular. And I mean, I think it's been obvious for so long, um, but I think, you know, I think that there was always an expectation that there would be some sort of at least safety net for all or you know something at the very bare minimum and it's not there and i think um the fact that an organization like ours who's kind of jumped into the space the private sector like curative like other folks are figuring this out because of the absolute absence of leadership and absolute absence of any sort of guidelines standardization um you know sort of pooled uh, procurement or anything basic that you would expect to happen has not happened and therefore it's been an absolute um, decentralization and an absolute free market approach to figuring out a pandemic shows the absolute failure of our systems. So as an organization, you know, our role to kind of fill that gap between institutions and the community for us, we feel that responsibility. We feel like there is a much bigger gap than what we can fill, um, but we, you know, we know that there's a space for us. Um, everything that we've been doing, we've been blueprinting because we know that us as an organization cannot do this alone. Nobody can do this alone. Let's try to replicate this as much as possible. We've costed out every, in, in terms of the operational piece of actually the testing piece on the ground, we have, costed that out, we have shared that publicly, we have shared our SOPs, every single um, version of how you can 
increase testing capacity on the ground because we need to replicate it because what we're seeing is an absolute lack of any sort of, again, standardized structure or, or way to do this. Um, so for us, it, it, it does come back to the communities. It does come back to regular citizens to take on this role that has been left bare that the, the, these institutions have basically failed us in. So communities are stepping in and again, you know, using something that doesn't require medical assistance or medical background or training to be able to administer has been the boon for us because it means that it allows us to bring in community members who are unemployed, who need the work, who are incredibly, incredibly trusted within their own communities to bring out those folk has been critical for us to increase the number of people getting tested. So it's been a very, very, um, it's been a wake up call, I think for us as an organization to see this in the United States in our own backyard. We've seen this so many places in the countries that we usually work in, um, but to see it here, it's, it's been a shock. So sorry to, to join in the, the pessimistic party, but I am definitely in it. But I do think again, also ending in a hopeful note that um, it's, you know, it's not to say like all institutions because you know the mayor's offices that we work with they're phenomenal they're again jumping into this role much more outsized than i think is what is normally expected of them as is the communities the communities are the ones that at the base are just really stepping up and 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 jumping into to solve this if i may follow up on that and uh, i am very much inspired by that because we need exactly a sense of community uh, of uh, basically uh, cooperation uh, because ultimately uh, pandemics like COVID-19 are the classic example of an externality. Uh, if everybody just acts in their own self-interest, uh, then uh, we will infect people, we will not make sure uh, to isolate ourselves, we will not distance enough uh, and ultimately the disease will just spread and spread and uh, I'm very much inspired and that makes me slightly less pessimistic to listen to you <laughs> uh, that there's so much go work going on that really recognizes that and that really builds on uh, the existing sense of uh, community that is out there uh, and uses that to essentially uh, nip the pandemic in the uh, bud. Yeah, I can mention another example about the differences in or how existing inequities are seen yet again in the times of COVID. So our first lab is based in San Dimas. It's right outside of LA. And our strongest partner has been Mayor Garcetti's office in, in Los Angeles. Here alone, we've tested more than half a million people. But LA has a lot of money to spend and to buy the tests and to set up these test sites. And then when we talk to other cities that desperately need testing like Oakland, written in their city charter, they are not allowed to use any deficit funding and they don't have funding allocated for something like COVID testing. And so they literally have no money to do this. And their mayor now has to transform her job into being a philanthropic fundraiser, trying to find the money to do this. And it has been so hopeful to see CORE be so focused on serving the cities that probably need, need the most help and have been fund, fundraising to be able to help those communities first. Yeah, and I think this is such a moment for this idea of participatory democracy because, you know, we're seeing communities step up, we're seeing major portions of the public, despite you know the media coverage of protests against lockdowns, and that is obviously there, but so many people support being more cautious. So many people have been supported supporting wearing masks. And if there was a lot more democratic control over where funding goes, like where, you know, the stimulus money as many sessions have discussed went largely to big corporations. I, I just imagine, and based on polling, that if Americans and citizens in different countries had had control over where funding went, you know, it wouldn't be that way. It would go to small businesses. It would go to these kinds of wage programs or I, you know, and I think that is where the hope comes in. And it's been amazing to see 
civil society, but also communities as, as everyone's talked about, like people themselves becoming a part of that process. And imagine how it could be if they didn't have to do that in a crisis out of desperation, but instead were supported to do that at all the time to, you know, to not survive, but thrive essentially. Like, I think it shows us um, how important that that is going forward. Um, and and I, I appreciate, you know, all the work everyone generally, but also the three of you are sort of doing in terms of facilitating that process. Thank you all so much. Um, our next question is that there's been some talk about how COVID-19 should prepare us for future pandemics or other long-term or medium-term risks like catastrophic climate change. Um, I know that several of you are looking at different risks that COVID could prepare us for, and I'd love for any or all of you to answer this question about what you think it teaches us about. And so maybe we'll start with you because I know that you have some research on how this relates to automation, which people might not expect it to connect to. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, l let me maybe start by saying it, uh, the epidemic has really underlined uh, all the shortcomings uh, that we suffer from. It has tested us at so many levels uh, and has put the spotlight, for example, uh, on uh, how unprepared our health systems are, how uh, difficult it is to deal with, with uh, for example, externalities uh, when you have a significant fraction of the population that's uninsured and so on and so forth. Uh, now, uh, what can we learn about future uh, potential catastrophic risks? Uh, and yeah, uh, as Avital mentioned, uh, one of the future risks uh, that I'm particularly interested in uh, is increasing automation and what that may do uh, to uh, the ability of uh, regular people to earn a living wage. Uh, and uh, so, I think it has done two things. On the one hand, uh, even though it has highlighted how inadequate our current uh, governmental and social systems uh, for providing for the disadvantaged are, it has also uh, created uh, a much more acute awareness. Uh, and I'm very much with Divya uh, here that that makes me uh, more optimistic about the future. Uh, because uh, I do think that uh, people today understand much better uh, that we do need more uh, collectivism, uh, that we do need uh, to yeah, take more care of each other uh, and hold together uh, when a big crisis hits. But I'm wondering if that is what is being evidenced right now with this response, right? Like. Yeah, having having a sense of like responsibility to each other, the whole idea of you know um, what we what we do specifically affects somebody else. What what I'm worried about is that you know in preparation for the next big thing, like you know as an organization like that focuses and invests in communities for preparedness, like time and time again, it is the one area that is the hardest to fundraise for. It is the hardest to get money for because you don't see the, the direct impact or the direct feeling of, of giving something after a disaster. So we do, we have several preparedness programs in, in areas that have already been hit by disasters. And we, we focus on trying to building, to build up communities, to strengthen them so that the next disaster they're stronger. Funding for those things is like the, the smallest in comparison to all of the disaster response stuff that we do. And I think it's just a human response, right? It's like we're, we respond to the emotional part of it. And so to me, you know, seeing these disasters over and over and over again, like really, really um, not forgetting these moments and like really thinking about, um, you know, what makes a community stronger, especially the most vulnerable ones, to be able to, to not get so impacted. I mean, there's been studies where, you know, in, uh, we're talking about the United States. So FEMA gives 
uh, funding because their objectives are not to give money to the people who need it the most, but it's sort of the, the most effective use of their dollars. And so um, all these studies show that that money does not go to the poorest and the people who need it the most, who have lost the most. It goes to where their money is the safest, which usually is in middle income or higher income families that can recover faster. So again, you're constantly in this trap the minute that you hit that poverty line, poverty line. So again, that focus on the preparedness piece to strengthen communities is, is, is something that is so important. And yet you have the least amount of funding and the least amount of interest. So it's about changing some sort of narrative, changing almost the sexiness of preparedness and that strengthening piece so that it's not all the money just coming in during a disaster after disaster that kind of pulls on people's emotional side to it that I think is super important. Um, and how you figure that out, it's, it's still a black box to me, but now seeing this pandemic, it's so much more evident that we really need to invest in, you know, communities of color, communities that are, are under the poverty line, because they are the ones that get the least amount of money and always get hit. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, in terms of being prepared for the future, it's not really about like over indexing on the idea of the next pandemic, right? Like hiring more health officers is great. And it's true if the US had had certain kinds of, you know, health systems in place, this wouldn't have happened or wouldn't have happened as badly perhaps. But but as Anne was saying, I really think preparedness is about building up our whole system from the bottom up. Like it's it's about getting rid of these or dismantling these factors that lead to this virus hitting the US so hard. And those are, you know, a much deeper issue than just we didn't have a certain position staffed or like a certain person, you know, didn't recommend something early enough. Like those are symptoms, obviously. Um, and, and so I, I, again, think that we will be able to do a better job of the next crisis um, if, if we're able to build up those systems and if we're able to change the nature of how we think about things like resource allocation, how we think about inequity, how we think about um, labor, as you were saying, or unemployment or um, various kinds of things being tied to your job and therefore you're, you know, like all of those processes, how do we build that up so that no matter what the next crisis is or, um, you know, forget a crisis, like no matter how we're living normally, we can, we can be better as a society, right? Like who's to say the number of people who are living in poverty in the US before COVID wasn't a crisis in, of, in and of itself. Like, and, and we want to address those as well. And I think preparedness looks like coming at it from that angle, in addition to the smaller steps and, and equally important steps, I guess, in, in terms of, okay, we prepare for similar things like this and we should have done that before. But I think the best thing to do would be to go deeper. I said, do you have anything you want to add? It's okay if you feel like it's yes. been covered well, too. Yeah. yeah. So certainly when I was running for public office, I wanted so desperately transformative change. And, you know, when you advocate for climate advocacy and everyone's life is at stake, the health of the earth is at stake and people don't mobilize for it. It can be so frustrating. And it's been really fascinating to see how when something like COVID hits, wow, things can come to a halt. People can stop flying their airplanes. We can find funding for certain things or change or be more excited about remote work or virtual education. We can change these, the way we've been doing things time and time again. Um, and the whole COVID effort frequently reminds me of war. And there's this great, great quote that war is the force that gives us meaning. And so it's been great to see how people can mobilize for a special cause. Um, and I think it, it has changed lots of things like how we view who is essential in our, in our society, um, how inequities play out in times of crisis. Um, like one of my favorite people is Paul Farmer and he talks about preferential treatment for the poor. And I wish we could focus more on that, kind of like what Anne was talking about. 
Um, and the other thing that makes me hopeful and certainly has been true in my personal case is I've learned so much more about science. I've always been an advocate for STEM. Um, it's one of the reasons I ran for Congress. I'm an engineer and I thought we needed more scientists and engineers. Um, but I've learned so much about viruses and how, how a lab works. And it's, it's been so fascinating. And I hope more people have gotten the same curiosity to learn about science and think about that more in the future. Thank you. It also is um, it's nice to see us fighting a war on a virus or hopefully next a war on poverty rather than a war on another nation state or something. So I think that right now it's good to see us directing our sort of nationalistic attention towards a, a real crisis and trying to uplift communities in the process. Um, my next question, um, or actually we time has absolutely flown um, in this wonderful conversation and we now have five minutes left. I'm getting the five minutes. You, but I believe we can get through the two audience questions that have been voted one for um, Anne and Agatha first which is what do you think about the second wave of the virus in some of the Southern US states? And do you think the response in testing is the right one right now? And that's from Fanny. Go ahead, Agatha. <laughs> I was just, you should start because you've been, you've been really in the thick of it. Um, I find you're breaking up a little bit, but I think the question was, what do we think about the increase in, in, in cases in the South? Is that right? And the second wave, potential second wave. Yeah, I, that's what I heard too. Okay. I mean, the, the whole reason why we had gotten into this testing, this testing um, space is, you know, I'm, I'm Korean. Uh, I was born in the States, but I was watching what Korea was doing early on around testing and tracing. And to me, you know, much like, you know, Taiwan and all these other Asian, Asian countries, like as a democracy, they were still very capable to do the testing piece and the tracing piece to really get a handle on it. And, and, to, and that's why it was like, okay, we need to increase the amount of testing. So that's, that's how we sort of jumped into the space and, and watching them and watching outside of the United States, like they're ahead of us in so many ways, not just timing wise and where, you know, how it's hitting them, but we're seeing that they're also getting some, you know, sort of dips and, and peaks and stuff um, from second waves and, and sort of outbreaks and such. And that's the best case scenario that we're not even near. So the fact that we are not even close to understanding how, you know, who has it, how to stem it, the contact tracing piece in so many of the cities that we work in is also very spotty. Everyone's kind of doing, it's the same thing with tracing. Everyone's doing it in a, in a different way and at different scales and, and pacing. Um, so I don't think we're anywhere near even completing the first wave of cases to even consider what the second wave is gonna be like. So for us, you know, it is about what we're doing now. And even though, you know, because of, working so closely with the mayor's office where they're doing the majority of the testing that we do in the country, but still like, you know, we're at the 500,000 people we've tested so far since we started, um, you know, 350 of those coming from Los Angeles, but even then is a drop in the bucket and means nothing comparative to what we should be doing. Like, and, and this is, so just to wrap our brains around it, it's like to think about the second wave, we're not even past understanding what the first wave looks like. So testing needs to increase like exponentially. Again, that's why we keep pushing out, like we're not gonna ever be the ones and nor have we ever tried or pretended to be like, you know, the ones that are gonna do all the testing, but we need to exponentially replicate what we're doing everywhere, everyone who can do this. And it's not that costly. It's not rocket science. I mean, our piece is not. The science piece, what Agatha does is rocket science. And I leave that up to them to take care of. But our piece to administer those things, well, if we get test kits in our hands, any organization, any entity, very cheaply can run these sites to increase the amount of testing that can happen. And we, we should be also looking at that model around contact tracing, which is what we're trying to do. But again, at the end of the day, we're not anywhere near where we should be even to address the first wave. And yes, there will be a second wave. It's just one big old cresting wave right now. 
Yeah, and I think in terms of, you know, the part of the question that, that Anne was discussing is, is testing the right strategy. I don't think any of these initiatives are saying we just test, right? Like contact tracing is a big part of that too. It's not just how much you test. And like Anne was saying, you know, our plan says around 5 million tests per day. We're nowhere near that. But it's also who you test. How do you use those tests? And it's great to be testing people who are coming in. Tests should be free, you know, all of those things. But what we really need to be doing and what most of the successful countries did is getting most of their positive test results from contact tracing. And we're just really not there yet either. And I think this kind of brings up that question of, of technocracy versus community because there was so much said about contact tracing apps at the beginning of this. And it's important. And if we put out an app, it should be privacy preserving. And you know, I wrote a paper on this. I agree with all of that. But at the end of the day, it's trusted community workers, like, like Anne was saying, that need to be doing contact tracing. What we need to be doing is building up a force of people to be doing this, you know, tech isn't going to save us from that. It could augment, but we're not looking at it that way. We're not looking at it as an augment. And that means we're behind on the tech piece, but we're majorly behind on the human piece of it. And I think if, if we're going to ramp up our solution and there's still time, like our plan doesn't say, you know, yes, we're not doing a good job now, but our plan doesn't say it's over that's sadly it's not over we wish it was so there's still time to ramp up our response in terms of testing but but in terms of contact tracing and in terms of supporting isolation most people can't afford to stay home um so exactly. you know your paper now we can still we can still do a good job of this i i i think that's a perfect note to end on um as unfortunately we were absolutely at time um but i encourage everyone to follow uh these four speakers and their work and to read their papers and to follow their organizations. They're doing fantastic work to try to ensure um, that we do get out of this crisis as quickly as possible. So thank you so much, the four of you, for coming to this. And I'm so sorry that I have to cut you off in the middle of this brilliant conversation. So um, thank you all, and I hope you have an amazing night. And thank you for watching, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.